you a question. When you first hear something, what is your first response? Is it positive or is it negative? Positive or negative? Just think that through for a second. I remember when I first came here a number of years ago, and we had the education building next door, which is the brick building next door. That's all, just that, and, and push that way, all the brick stuff that was over there. And that's pretty much all that we had. We were sitting on two acres of land, and I, I remember it was 1995 when I, I came here to be the pastor. And I remember going outside, and behind us, there were duplex apartments. Now, our, our B building and our C building are two of those duplex apartments, so they were like that. And there were 33 of them behind us. This is 1995. And I used to, Debbie Capps was my secretary back then, and I would stand outside, and it was basically just me and Debbie and a couple of others. And I would stand outside, and I would look into those apartment buildings, and, and they were pretty downtrodden and stuff like that, but I would stand there, and I would look at them. And she would say, Pastor, what are you doing? And I said, don't, don't you see it? Don't you see what God wants to do on the north end of this property? When it comes to Wilmington, they're not making any more land because it squeezes down into a beach and everything's coming this way. And one day, uh, the greatest opportunity in all the city of Wilmington is going to be right here on this north side. And when that time comes, I promise you, none of this will be available. I think we need to buy it. And it's like, well, but man, those things are expensive. And I'm like, yep. And I remember that our church wanted to buy them uh, earlier on when I first got saved. They, there was talk of buying those things. And they were $65,000 for a duplex. Sixty-five. Could you imagine today if you could buy it for sixty-five? It was $65,000 a duplex when that first happened. And we didn't. Brought it to the congregation. Like, ah, I don't think we can do that. And so I finally brought it to our church. And I was like, look. It's never going to get cheaper, ever. At that time, they were $119,000 a piece. I was like, they're not going to get cheaper next year or the next or the next or the next or the next. I really feel like we need to bite the bullet and purchase for the future of this church. I may be dead and gone, and they may never remember me, but when there's a larger campus out here and can reach more people, They'll be thankful that somebody thought about it. I think we need to purchase that property. And so it was going to be, you know, like $3 million. And I led the church to do that, and they did that. And then they tore all those houses down. And now, now we have what you see, and we have great opportunity to be able to continue to do some other things. But it was a challenging time because, man alive, I'm telling you, we, we didn't have a lot of people Here's like 150 people here, and I'm leading them to do a $3 million project. But we did, and it was, it's amazing, and we've, we've been able to enjoy that the whole time. Here's a question I have to ask for you. When you walk out and you look at an empty field or something, what do you see? When you look to the future, what do you see? When you hear about a missionary who's been detained in Cuba, what do you think? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Oh, no, we're going to lose them? Oh, oh, hallelujah, God's getting ready to use them. What do you think? What do you see? If you were a farmer and you're looking over empty fields in planting season, what do you see? The farmer sees the harvest. The farmer sees the crop. The farmer sees the opportunity. What do you see? When we look out into the brand new year, what do you see in the brand new year? Same thing as last year? Or do you, because what's out in the field when the farmer gets ready to plant the field? What's in the field? What? Nothing. Before he plants the field, you know what's in the field? Nothing. Nothing, right? Nothing. What do they see? A whole harvest. When you look out into your future and there's nothing, what do you see? I just graduated college. Do you have a job? No, there's nothing out there. What do you see? Do you see the nothing or do you see your future? Do you see what's out there in front of you? And unfortunately, what we've got today is that a lot of us don't understand what really, really, really is out in front of us. Are you aware that you are the average of the five people you hang around the most. 
Your attitude is the average of the five people you hang around the most. Your lifestyle is the average of the five people you hang around the most. Your future is determined by the five people you hang around the most. Who you hang out with? Do you hang out with people that always are negative? Whenever you say something, oh, have you thought about that? What if this happens? What if that happens? Do you know what's going to happen here? Or, or is the first response, I think you can do it. I think we can do it. I think we ought to try. I think we ought to give it a shot. What is it like whenever you're hanging out with people? It's like, well, I guess, well, it's me. It's always going to be this way. We're always going to be poor. We're always going to be broke. Nobody ever breaks through this kind of stuff. What do you see? I want to talk to you today on the subject, on the law of God that we've been talking about, that the law of God that says God will not be mocked. Whatever man sows, that's going to also what he's going to reap. I want to talk about the fourth facet of this law, more. You see, the Bible teaches us that you will always reap more than you have sown. What a waste of time to take a kernel of corn, stick it in the ground, come back three months later, and it grew up to have one kernel of corn on it. Hey, could you imagine? It's like, I'm going, where are you going? Harvest? And you go, there it is. There it is, right? Remember the guy with the talents? That's what he did. Uh, you've been gone for three months? Uh, here's your talent. And you're like, whoa, wait a minute. That's not what I was expecting. I was expecting more. I want you to know today that we serve a God of more. In the very beginning, when God first sent us out into the world, here's what he said. He says, I want you guys to, listen to what I'm going to say, be fruitful. In other words, I want more. Multiply. I want more. Go and fill the earth. I want more. Subject all things and take dominion over everything in the earth. I want more. God is a God who created a world that will always produce more than we put into it, always. He said, the only thing I don't want you to do is to eat from this tree. That's it. Don't eat from the tree, and the day you do, you're going to die. What did they do? They ate from the tree. Why is it that man always wants what's his not to have and never goes after what is freely his to take? Why is that? And when we go after it, we always go after it in the wrong fashion. And you know what's the challenge? As far as I can tell, Adam and Eve never did what God told them to do. They only did what he told them not to do. Let me give you an example. Put your thinking caps on, okay? My job is to think about stuff that you don't think about, so when I think about it and tell you, you'll start thinking about it, okay? So here's, here's the thought. Uh, did Adam and Eve, God says, I want you to what? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, take dominion over everything in the entire planet, okay? Okay. Um, Adam and Eve ever leave the Garden of Eden prior to the fall? They hanging out where things are good. He told them to be fruitful and multiply. Any children born before the fall? No. Hey, he said, you get to take dominion over all the book, the bugs, the birds, the bees, everything. You get to take dominion over all that. Any pets before the fall? You hear about Fido? Before the fall, any trained elephants or animals or zoos or stuff like that? that they, no. They didn't do anything prior to the fall until God kicked them out of the garden. And then things were different. What a challenge it is. They didn't understand what they had capacity to enjoy. And I think that we are challenged with that sometimes too. Let me give you a thought. Whenever I was awakened into my awareness that I'm here, so somewhere between four and a half, five years old, the first uh, real long-term memories that I have, we lived in Wilmington, California. It's a suburb of Los Angeles. My dad was in the Air Force. We reti he retired or got out of the Air Force, uh, landed in a job at McDonnell Douglas Aircraft Division in Los Angeles, California. We were living just on the outskirts in Wilmington, California, and I, I kind of remember that whole thing. And... I had a favorite holiday in California. You know what it was? Halloween. You want to know why? Somebody said Christmas in the early I was like, no, we were broke. You know, when you don't get a lot for Christmas, it's not the greatest holiday. But we had, a, we had good Christmases. But I love Halloween. You want to know why? You got free candy. Now, it wasn't until I got here and started coming to church that I realized what a pagan I was for enjoying Halloween. 
Uh, I just thought it was a fun holiday where you dressed up and got free candy. I found out, no, you're actually worshiping the devil and killing chickens. But I never did that. Uh, you know, that's just what religious people tell you you're doing. I never did that. But it was so cool because when we went to California, you dress up and we put on paper bags and stuff like that. I remember my dad dressed up like a hippie hoppy one time. Had some, that's what he called himself. I'm a hippie hoppy. And he had some paper plates stuck on him and it, just, it was an incredible looking thing. We even got pictures of that still. Don't we have pictures, Mom? I think we got pictures. Uh, nonetheless, when we would go from door to door, you only had to go to about five places and your bag was full. Because those people would go two handfuls and they would dump it in your bag. Go to about five houses. We come home, throw it in the floor, and go back out because this was free candy. And see, we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't exactly know that. But every now and then, my mom and dad would give me like three or four cents or something like that. You're like, three or four cents? Oh, hey, listen, back in 1960, whatever it was, whenever I was there, it's like 65, 66, they had a thing called penny candy. It actually cost a penny. You could buy one piece of candy for a penny. They had these suckers, and I think they were two cents for these suckers. And if you open up this sucker and it had a piece of paper in it, you got an extra sucker for free. So uh, that was so cool. So we would go to the sucker thing. Uh, not that one. Here it is. Here it is. <laughs> go get some more. Oh, such a sinner. We would do that, right? Okay, moved, moved to Wilmington, North Carolina. I mean, we were stretching. Moved to Wilmington, North Carolina. First Halloween, I'm thinking, sweet, it's Halloween. A trick or treat. <laughs> Seriously? That's it? You know, if you go somewhere else, here, here you go, honey. Here, don't eat all this at one time now, right? I'm like, are you kidding me? That's not how we did. I always got handfuls of candy. So if you come to my house on Halloween, if we happen to be there, you know, we're not going to be sacrificing chickens, but we will give out some candy. And when I give out candy, I give it out by two handfuls. <laughs> or I take this big old bowl and I stick it in front of the kid and I was like, get what you want. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, get what you want. So you know what they'll do? They'll pick one piece of candy. I'm like, come on, get what you want. They're like, really? And then they their moms and dads like, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. Listen, we run out, we'll close the door. But whoever comes by here gets, let me tell you why I'm like that. Because I don't see lack. There's not a shortage of candy. Last time I checked, there's not a shortage of candy. When we've done trunk or treat out here, we typically spend 20 thousand dollars in candy. You want to know why? Not a shortage. Not a shortage. So I said, why don't y'all do trunk or treat? It costs 20 grand <laughs> to do trunk or treat. And that's the candy we buy. That didn't inca- include the candy that the people that set up their trunks bought initially. That's when we just go refill the trunks we discovered we probably ought to start buying wholesale to get more candy. But there's not a shortage. Listen, God created a world where there is no lack. It's just supply. He created a world that will produce for you more than you put in. And yet, many of us go all the way through our life in total lack. All we see is lack. Boy, it must be nice. I don't know how to do that. I sure wish I could make that kind of money. I sure wish I could do that. I don't know how people do that. That is crazy. How could you pay something for that? And you go through your whole life in lack. Your whole life. All you see is what you can't have, what you can't do, what is never going to be yours. You go through your whole life in lack. I want to encourage you today that my goal is to get you to see abundance. And see, it doesn't have to be that way for you. You're here today. I want to give you some principles that I think can really, really help you. And so I want to examine this fourth facet of the law of God, this facet of God says you get to reap more than you've sown. Look in your Bible, Mark chapter 4, in verse 8 and 9, it says this. As as he was talking about various seeds, he says, now there was other seed that fell into the good ground. And what did it do when it fell into the good ground? It yielded a crop, it sprang up, it increased, and it produced. And he says, hey, if any of you have ears to hear, let him hear. 
Now, I want you to understand that the Bible is not here talking so much about seed and soil, that God is using a metaphor of seed and soil to understand what he is talking about. And when he talks about the seed, because he explains this parable to the disciples, he says, the seed is the word of God. Let me ask you a question. What, is, what are words for? What are they for? What, what do you put words into? Into your mind. So the soils that he's talking about is not dirt. He's talking about your mind, the way you think, the, the mentality that you have, what's going on in your head. And he said there were four kinds of soils. There was one soil that was a wayside soil that everybody had walked on and trampled on, and it was a hard pack, and the, the word doesn't even go in. It just bounces right off. Some folks come in here, and they, they listen to me. It's like, that boy's an idiot. I can't even believe you'd listen to anything else to say. It just comes in, and bink, it goes right off because you've been trampled so much. I get that. He said the second kind of soil is a little bit, it's a little stony, but there's just not a lot of earth in it. And so when something comes in, it starts to sprout, but as soon as the sun comes up, it burns it up and it dies off. And so it goes away. And the third kind of soil has weeds in it and those weeds grow faster than the, than the crop. And so what ends up happening is the weeds choke the life out of it and it dies and there's no production. There's only one soil that has production in it, but he's not talking about soil so much as the way that we think. Do you think because you've been trampled all of your life, nothing goes in? You have stories. My dad, my mom, my brothers, my sisters, my boss, my neighbors. You have stories about how somebody trampled all over you. And so now you're kind of hard. Nothing goes in. I would pray that God would break open your fallow ground and allow you to, to receive some nourishment. Some of us just got a lot of stones in there, and the stones weren't bad. He says, it's not a lot of earth. He didn't really complain about the stones as much as he said, there's just not a lot of earth. And so because of that, they can't get any roots real deep, and the sun burns the roots up, and so they don't stay very long. For some of us, uh, we're so shallow, we'll, we'll, we want the, you know, let's just give me, the, give me the short story. Give me the cliff notes. Give me the quick stuff. Don't, 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 don't make me study. Don't make me get down deep. Don't let me, I don't need to know theory. Just give me the quick stuff. The quick stuff won't hold real tight, you know? I want the, I want the book summary. I, I, I just want somebody to tell me the answers. I want somebody to do something. It won't last very long. And for others, even though the soil might be deep, it's that you got too much going on in your life to really nurture what's in there. And so whether it's sports or whether it's your job or whether it's all the playing that you do or whatever, you don't have any time to, to really invest in something else. And he said, that's not going to do you any good. You need to get into some good soil, okay? So as, as, we, as we deal with this area, I've only got one thing that I want to tell you, but i got six sub points, so I'm going to give you more, okay? But we'll try to go through pretty quick. And this first thing is a little bit controversial, but I hope you'll grab a hold of it. One thing I want to tell you today, number one, here it is. We live in a world of abundant equal opportunity. We live in a world of abundant equal opportunity. I recognize that if you go to the social realm, to the political realm, we've got plenty of people that are going to tell you that you don't have equal opportunity. I recognize that. That's hog slop, okay? The seed doesn't care who plants it. You are not the seed. You're the sower. You plant that seed in the ground. It's the seed that grows. You just got to plant it. And it doesn't care who plants it. Whether I plant it, my son plants it, a stranger plants it, a woman plants it, uh, Asian, black, white, red, yellow, green, Muslim, Christian, it doesn't make any difference. The seed doesn't care who plants it. It's of equal opportunity. Now, we may have a variety of obstacles in front of us, and some of you may have more obstacles than somebody else, but we all have the same opportunity. And some of us don't take advantage of the opportunity. What is the opportunity? To reap more than you sow. I want you to think about this. We live in a world that God says, I've created it such that if you'll put something in, it will give you more than you put in. What good would it do to just get back one for one? No, he's going to give you more, and we live in a land that allows us to have more. Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verse 2, he said unto them, the harvest is truly plentiful. It's there. It's great. But the laborers are few. Therefore, let's pray to the Lord of harvest that he'll send more laborers out there into his harvest. So it's not that there's not something to collect. It's that sometimes we don't want to do it. So if you live in a place of lack today, you've got to ask yourself this question, Why? We're living in a land that's totally filled with opportunity, and God's making a promise to you that you can get 30, 60, 100 fold so long as you plant the right seed in the right dirt in the right season, harvest it at the right time, and keep it nurtured and cared for. It will return to you 30, 60, 100 fold. How come you don't have that? Why are you in lack? I've got six reasons why I think it might be, 
And I don't say this to criticize you, I say this to inform you, and if you're in one of those areas, one or more, I wanna ask you to kick them away today, okay? Sometimes we just have to be made aware, so let's go through them. Number one, you could have a mind of restricted opportunity. The Apostle Paul went to the church at Corinth, and that was the most wicked church that he'd ever gone to. They did everything wrong. They were in bad conditions. They were sexually immoral. Uh, they were financially immoral. They were immoral in every kind of way that you could think of. And they, they was always whining, always complaining, always fussing, always down on themselves. We can't, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't. And Paul kept saying, yes, you can, yes, you can, yes, you can, yes, you can. Here's what you can do. Here's what you're supposed to do. Here's how you do it. And finally, he got so fed up with them that on his second letter to the Corinthians, in chapter 6 and verse 11, he said this, Oh, Corinthians. He says, we have spoken openly to you and our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us. You are restricted by your own affections. Have you ever talked to somebody that no matter how much opportunity is in front of them and how much you share that with them, that every time you say something to them, you're like, no, I can't do that. No, I can't do that. No, it's not possible. No, it won't work out the way. No, you don't understand. No, it cannot be. No, I cannot forgive. No, it's like, yes, you can. Yes, you can. No, I can't. He's like, look, you have a mind of restricted opportunity. You think in your mind that everybody's against you when the only person against you is you. Stop, if you wanna stop listening to somebody, don't listen to your people tell them, don't listen to that person. Don't. No, the one person you need to quit listening to is yourself. And you know that to be true, right? You ladies, you looking in the mirror, I'm fat. Your husband's like, what are you talking about? What would you do if he agreed with you? You sure are, babe. Woo. <laughs> See, you don't, you don't want that. <laughs> oh, I get in trouble. Number two, let's move on. <laughs> you choose to live in seed killing dirt. See, he told you there's three kinds of soil that'll kill that seed. And what do we do? We, we'll live in it. Listen, Mark chapter four, he says, some fell on stony ground where it didn't have much earth and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it scorched it because it had no root, it withered away. Some seed fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no crop. So sometimes we find ourselves among circumstances and situations and environments that are not healthy to the growth of our seeds. They're not healthy to the growth of our life. It, it, listen, when, when people are having marital trouble, I say, don't go talk to people who have marital trouble. To help you out, I'd get rid of the bum. No, no, let's not go there. Let's see if we can figure out if there's a potential of forgiveness, if there's things that they don't know, if there's areas that we could help you with. Let's, let's see if we can work on that first. Doesn't mean it's gonna work out. But man, there might be an opportunity. There might be. Let's go there. Again, what is your first uh, thing there? It's like, are the people around you so negative? Because I'm telling you, man, I, I, I've been around some people that, have you ever been around that person that you could wake up in the morning, you're so vibrant, but after about five minutes with them, you're like a jellyfish. You need to go to bed. You need a vacation. It's like, you've been talking to that, I told you not to talk to that person because I'm telling you, they'll just, they hook up. It's terrible, right? Stay away because you can't help them. Sometimes you got to get out of that seed killing dirt. Number three, you're planting bad seed. Jesus said, Matthew 7, 18, a good tree can't bear bad fruit and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. Now, here's the thing with the fruit. The fruit, according to the scriptures, says the seed for the next fruit is in the fruit of the, the thing that just came off the tree. So if you have a good tree that bears good fruit, the seed inside of the fruit will be good fruit again and bear another good tree. So it says you're not gonna have a good tree that has a bad fruit with bad seed inside of it. Sometimes we're planting bad seeds. Sometimes we're planting things that aren't gonna work. So uh, I want you to think about that. How is it that we live in a country that is so amazingly fruitful to us? America is a capitalistic society. Some people don't like that, but here's basically what capitalism means. It means that we believe that money ought to be in your hands rather than the government, that you know how to spend your money better than the government does. I happen to agree with that. I think that it's better to have thousands of farmers than one farmer who's really thinking about himself and not us. And so we should be able to, to invest our own monies and stuff like that. But we live in a country of capitalism, not socialism, which 
Somebody apparently wants that now. But nonetheless, uh, it's opportunity, wealth, freedom, availability, markets, uh, customers, infrastructure. We have freedom and opportunity to make as much money as we want, even though some people don't like that. You can make as much as you want for yourself, for your family, for your friends, for the church, for whatever you want to. And so why don't we? Why don't we? I mean, if we live in... Let me ask you a question. Y'all aren't getting this. If I were to ask anybody in the world, I can put you in any country that you want to, but I need to put you somewhere where you can make the most money and have the most opportunity. Where do you want to live? Where are they going to tell me? America. Why? Because of the environment that America has. And yet Americans are fussing about us. Why? You're planting bad seed. You're planting bad seed. You're deciding all that's against you rather than all that's for you. You're not paying attention to what's out there in front of you and what's for you. Man, start planting some better seed. And we certainly need to as the family of God. Number four, you might be reaping before you sow. Let me tell you how this works. You ever reap before you sow? Sure you have. Here's how it works. Back in my day when I was a young kid, uh, whenever you ran out of money, if you wanted to invest in something, when you ran out of money, you were done. You know, it's like, hey, can you do some more? I'm broke. Now, in our society, you can zip right on past zero, right? You just get you a credit card or something like that, and you can zip right on past zero. And so here's what a credit card is. It's reaping before you've sown. Oh, I want this, but I don't have any money. Oh, no worries. We'll give you the money. Now you're going to have to work for it sooner or later. Here's the problem with that. The law of sowing and reaping works in the inverse as well. So in other words, if you buy something for $100, guess what? You're not going to pay $100 for it. You're going to pay more. How much was that house you just bought? $100,000. No, it was $300,000. Just check the amortization chart, and you'll discover that you're going to pay a whole lot more than, you, than the purchase price. It just sounds good. We might be reaping before we've sown, and then we're in trouble, right? Hey, listen to this next. This is a passage of Scripture. You're going to love this. You might not like me for it, but listen to what it says. 2 Thessalonians. Paul comes to this church, and he says this. Hey, we command you, brethren... In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition that you have received from us. He says, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, that we were not disorderly among you, nor do we eat anyone's bread free of charge. He says, this is what he says, but we worked with labor and toil, night and day. Boy, today, if you were to put out a a job description, what's the job description? You're going to have to work with labor and toil. What? Yeah, labor and toil, which means you're going to have to work and do the job, and it's going to be hard, and it's going to cause you to sweat by the sweat of your face. Labor and toil. I didn't sign up for labor and toil. I signed up for benefit package, not labor and toil. Not only labor and toil, night and day. What? You mean I don't have a three-hour work week? (laughs) A three-day work week? Five-hour lunch? Benefits, vacation, stuff like that. He says, no, labor and toil night and day. And then listen to what he says. He says, we didn't do that so that we wouldn't be a burden to you, not because we didn't have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you ought to follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, that if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For if we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies, Now, once again, I want you to think for a minute because I want to think for you so that you can think about stuff you wouldn't think about until I tell you to think about it. I want to see if you can draw a name up to your mind. Can any of you, anybody online, you know, type in or here, can you think of one name of one person who is presently working who is not eating? Can't draw one up, can you? Can you some can you think of some people who are not eating? Of course. What are they not doing? Working. What is the solution to world hunger? Working. That's some bad language, isn't it? That's some cruel thinking, isn't it? No, hang on a second now. If you can't think of a single soul who is working and not eating, all it takes to eat is to work. 
Doesn't that make sense? That makes sense. Doesn't mean we like it, but it still makes sense. It could be that you're not sowing any seeds, so you're not getting anything back. And you're trying to reap before you've sown. That's always a possibility. Number five, you won't trust a good ground. You know, the Bible says there in verse eight, some seed fell on good ground. And when it fell on the good ground, it yielded a crop, sprang up, increased and produced some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. It just depends. And we saw the 30, 60, 100 fold in the one talent, two talent, five talent people. So God says, this is a, a promise to you if you'll do it right. What is good ground? It's fertile, it's deep, and it is unobstructed. Think about this. Think about the church. A church is good ground. It's good ground. A church returns to you. We have relationships. We have help. We have support. We have salvation. Uh, we have growth. We have information. We have knowledge. We have all kinds of stuff. The church is good ground. But today, some people won't sow into the good ground because people have decided to say bad things about the church. Has the church done bad stuff? Of course it has. It's filled with people like you and me. There's no such thing as a perfect church. And if you do find a perfect church, when you go, it'll be imperfect because you're imperfect. I'm imperfect. But we have to sow into the good ground. We're at budget time and we're putting together our budget and stuff like that. That's a real challenge. Let me tell you why it's a challenge. 18% of our congregation gives. 18% of the people that come here actually put something in the box. Now, here's what that means. That means tithe. It means they've dropped, you've dropped at least $1 in that offering box at least one time in a 365 day period. So over 365 days, we've calculated that 18% of the people that attend here have sown into the church. Now let me tell you the challenge of the 18%, and here's the challenge of it. There's a, called the Pareto Principle, it's a rule that says there's an 80-20 rule. 80-20 rule says, you know what it says, 20% of the people do 80% of the work, 80% of the people take 80% of the uh, 20% of the people take it, give out there, and 80% suck up all the resources. So here, here's the question. If only 18% of the people give in our church, how many percentage of the people do we still have to pay for that come here for air conditioning, food, uh, paper towels? What, how many, what's the percentage? Uh, 100%. <laughs> right? We don't say, okay, if you didn't tithe, you can't use toilet paper. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't work that way, right? It doesn't work that way. But then when we look out there into the future, we have to look and say, my goodness, boy, this is a real challenge. It costs this much to take care of all these people, but only 18% of the people give. And so how do we create a budget to really make sure that everything happens uh, with this little amount of money? And we have to factor in some faith into that, and it can be a real challenge. And then we look at it and say, well, pretty much we're going to have to see more people come in and become part of our congregation because we haven't figured out how to get the congregation to give. What if, what if you just decided, hey, Pastor, I'm, I'm really in struggling. I've, I made some mistakes. I reap before I sow, and I'm in a lot of debt and all that kind of stuff. I wonder what would happen. What do you think would happen in the church if the 82% that never put anything in the offering plate, that all 82% of those people would put $5 a week in the offering plate? What would happen here? Oh, holy cow. Oh my goodness, what we could do. It'd be amazing what we could do if I could get people to sow into good ground. How about your family? Is your family good ground? Like I know that we all grow up and we hate our moms and dads, right? I don't, I love my mom and dad. But today it's real fashionable to talk about what a terrible dad you had, what a terrible mom you have. And, and it's like, they're not really terrible. And I may have some struggles, I understand that. And some may be more than others. But have you ever thought that if you started talking about how good they were, that, that what you sowed in might have a return? I don't know what you expect from your moms and dads when you tell them how bad they were when you're always telling, what do you expect to get back? This law of song reading, you can't beat it. Why don't you tell them how wonderful they are, how awesome they are, how much you love them, how encouraged you are? Uh, you ever eat any free food from them? <laughs> you know, when it says, if a man don't work, he don't eat, that didn't refer to the children because the children hang out until they eat and then they go, Right? What y'all having today, mom and dad? Uh, we're gonna eat and then we're leaving, right? That's how it works. It's okay. How about good friends? You ever sow into good friends? Is the only time you call your friends when you need something from them or do you ever just say, hey man, love you, I appreciate you, you know, for being a good friend? Do you ever sow into that? How about a good boss? 
You know, it's, it's popular today, just rip your boss to shreds. You ever thought, you ever met somebody who you worked side by side with and you thought they were an awesome person and they got an, a, an advancement to a boss position? You're like, I used to like them, but now they ain't my friend anymore. You know why? They moved up into a boss position. In the boss position, you can't do the same things you did whenever you're down this position. You don't even know what it's like to be the boss. Now you start criticizing your boss, but you expect that criticism to come back to you in blessing. What if you just encouraged your boss? Hey, I know it's tough and you can't show partiality and stuff like that. And I just want to say thank you for allowing me to continue to have a job and, and the way you're leading. And even if they're leading bad, uh, so if you tell them how bad they are, do you expect them to get better? If you sowed in something, some encouraging might make a big difference. How about our country? Uh, we, we, instead of sowing in this disrespect and disregard for our country, even if you don't agree with it, and I get all that, but what if we were to sow in some good stuff and be proud of our country again and proud of our people and proud of our nation, proud of our constitution and proud of the privilege that we have? I wonder what would happen if it would be different. You've got to learn how to trust the good ground. And this is good ground. It's a good economy. It's a good country. It's a good church, good families. It's a lot of good stuff. Let's sow into the good ground. And then finally... Uh, number six, it could be that you're thinking only of yourself and so there's no need for more. There's some people who never think about others. They never think about more. Like, why would God give you more? God would give you more because he wants you to do something for somebody else, not just yourself. In Philippians chapter two, the Bible says this, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or through conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only out for your own interest, but also for the interest of others. So he says, yeah, you got to take care of yourself, but man, God has created in such a way that you can get more than you need. I was at my brother-in-law's house yesterday. He had a whole table full of tomatoes because he'd grown some. He's like, please take some of this stuff. It's just going to rot because he had more than he needed. He's like, here, send some of this to mama. So I don't know if Terry got you your tomatoes or not. Did, she didn't? Ah, well. It's only because it's in the car or something. Did you bring them, Terry? You didn't. Well, okay. Well, we got more at the house. We'll carry some over there. So here's the thing, though. There's always, there's a need for more. Listen to Leviticus, what God said to his people in regard to strangers and foreigners. Listen to what God said to the nation of Israel. He says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field. Nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest, and you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape from your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. In other words, God says when the oxen makes that turn, don't go back there and try to square off the corners. Leave that stuff. And, and whenever they run over some stuff and it falls, don't pick it up. You, whatever goes into your basket when it goes through, that's all you need. Leave the rest for somebody else, and you don't invite them onto your property. When they come on and get it, you just let them come get it. You let them get stuff. That's what you do. You don't call the cops. You don't you know, private property and all that. And I'm not saying that you got to be not be careful, but I'm saying that he says, "Hey, I'm giving you more than you need because there are some people that even though yeah they're probably not working, they're not there yet, and we got to move people in the continuum. And so there's always going to be a group of people. The poor will always be with you. So there's always got to be somewhere there where they can get some help out there. So let's let people have some help. You got to have more so that you can help more." Man, we, if we're living in the greatest country in the world for opportunity, for growth, for capitalism, for money, for advancement, for everything, how is it that we have nothing? One answer, you're not sowing. You're just not sowing. You're expecting everything to come your way, and I'm telling you, it will destroy this land, and the church can turn it around. We can. Let's go to work with labor and toil, night and day. Plant in the right season, the right seed, in the right soil. Protect it and guard it. Make sure that you nurture it through the summer, harvest it in the fall. Let the winter kill off everything, all the weeds that were in there. Don't worry when the winters of life come. Learn how to handle those winters. Take advantage of the spring. Plant again. Because he said, hey, it yielded a crop, a crop. It didn't yield a crop every year. It yielded a crop. You got to take care of it every year. And so make sure that you do that. And if you're not ready to plant your own and you're not there yet, hey, 
get on somebody else's farm and say, let me help you take care of your crop, leave the corners for me, and hopefully I'll have something to go with. I'd encourage you to do that. I want you to embrace more today. Embrace the thought of more. More for you, more for others, more for our country, more for our church, more for everything. This country used to understand that, and I want you to understand it again, that we have the greatest opportunity in the world, and yet we have a whole bunch of people talking about what we do not have. Take advantage of what you have before we lose it. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. And I don't think we're that far away from losing it if we're not careful. If we're not careful, I want to admonish you today, take advantage of it. Okay, let us take the lead. Start by planting your spiritual seed of salvation. You need to be saved. I'm really fearful that a lot of people are gonna die and go to hell. I know that's not popular, but the truth of the matter is there's one God and one way to heaven, that's through Jesus Christ. And if you don't come that way, you don't come. And the, the outcome for everybody else is hell. It's just real. I'm not trying to scare you, I'm just being honest, but it don't have to be you either because today, goodness gracious, you can receive Christ. You really can. And if you're worried about walking down front, no worries. Out here at this back table, There'll be some folks back there. If you take your card back there, if you're a guest or you don't have to be a guest back there, there's a gift back there for you. Uh, no obligation. We'd love to collect some information so we can talk to you. We're not going to beat your door down or anything like that. But, man, we would love for you to be a part of this because we want you to have more. We do. Starts with a relationship with Jesus. Start there. Walk through the waters of baptism. Join the church. Start supporting and planting in a place where there's something good at your work, at your home, in your family, with your brothers. Uh, in your neighborhood, or wherever you're going. And as you plant, start to reap the harvest that is more. Now, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm getting ready. I'm taking vacation this week because Terry and I are going to be moving out of our house. We're building one, but it won't be done for like six or seven months, so we've got to move out. When I come back, uh, we're preaching for me next week, and then the following week, Johnny Hunt's going to be here, which I'm, I'll be here for that. But when I come back, I want to talk about the fifth subject of the harvest which says that you sow in proportion, also not just more, but you sow in proportion. You reap in proportion to as you sow. And the title of that message is Exponential. This is more. This is training wheels, man. This is training wheels. More. What about exponentially more? And God says, I've created the world and everything in it to return to you exponentially exponentially more than you have right now. And the kingdom of God and the family of God are the people that have the knowledge. I want you to have it. Every bit of it. Every bit of it. I'll tell you if we take advantage of it. Stand with me. Father, in Jesus' name, we love you. Thank you for the privilege of being here today. What a good day it's already been. I pray for Ada again. Thank you for this young lady. And Lord, I ask you that you would minister grace in her life. Also for Johnny Garman and for our highway patrol buddy. That in all things, Lord, you would give us beyond, above and beyond, exceedingly, abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think according to the power that works within us, which is the Holy Spirit of God, that you would increase. And today, Father, I pray for every person here who might find themselves in a situation of lack, that they would understand that you have to give before you get, you have to sow before you reap, you have to work before you get money back. You have to love before you're loved. You have to be a friend before you are going to get friends. It's the law of sowing and reaping, but you always get more back if you plant the right seed, if you plant it in the right soil, if you plant it in the right season, and if you harvest it when you're supposed to. There is a guarantee of more. Lord, I pray, help us to embrace that today. And let us start as we go to dinner, lunch, whatever we're going to do, let our words, let us use more words of kindness and appreciation and thanksgiving. If our waiter or waitress is not good to us today and they're lazy and they're slack and they're not doing what they're supposed to, let us say, hey, thank you. I know you're busy today. I really appreciated you bringing me tea or water or whatever. And uh, I know it's a hard day for you. We're praying for you. Just, just that we would put out into that ether of this world out there something that has the opportunity to grow and to return to us a good harvest. Let it be more. And before we leave today, I pray that there will be those that would stop by and that they would invest in this ministry in terms of helping take care of our children or to go over to the other side and to learn what we have to offer 
in terms of salvation, baptism, ministry, help, friendship, whatever it might be. I pray they'll take advantage of the opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. You're dismissed. Thank you for coming. We're right up front if you need us. We love you. Hope to see you next week.